So, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank everyone very much. Oh, okay. I would like to thank everyone that is organizing the event very much. Rebecca, Sofia, Emiliano, Leo, Alain, or cam the cameraman, <laughs> uh, for organizing this event and for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, and second, there are several things I would like to, be, to say I'm sorry for. Uh, First, first off, I'm sorry for speaking in English. In English, it's just that my Spanish is still very bad, muy malo, and I really didn't want to risk it. I thought it was better this way. Well, I think that. Bueno, primero que nada quiero agradecer a las y los organizadores de este evento, a la doctora Maldonado, a Sofía, a Leo, a nuestro colega en la cámara, y quiero empezar con algunas disculpas previas. La primera es por dar la conferencia en inglés. La realidad es que mi español todavía eh, no es lo ideal. Entonces, pues, para no arriesgarme, eh, tal vez considere que será una mejor opción. And uh, also, I tried to do what CY yesterday I actually tried to do, which was to translate with Google Translate the PowerPoint. So, hopefully, that helps a little. But I'm still sorry for the poor Google Translate translation. Uh, and also, well, as some of you already know, I'm not exactly a specialist in Japanese philosophy. My PhD is actually about German idealism. But I really try to make some comparisons and some approximations because that's, I think that can lead to very interesting results. But again, I'm not a specialist in, in Japanese philosophy, so I'm sorry when, whenever I say it is really very questionable, uh, to say the best. Eh, bueno, el paso de antes ya hacer lo mismo que CY intentó ayer, que fue eh, traducir que la ponencia está traducida en parte con Google Translate, pero por pues, la traducción no será óptima también, por eso me disculpo a semana. Y por último, eh, me disculpo, reconozco no ser especialista en filosofía japonesa, de hecho mi, mi trabajo de investigación actual es sobre filosofía alemana, eh, pero me parece que hay un plano de comparación interesante entre eh, entre el idealismo alemán y la filosofía japonesa, pero me disculpo antemano por si no digo algo que, que me reconozco entonces como no es especialista en filosofía japonesa. So, uh, what I wanted to talk about here is actually sort of a draft of my postdoc project, because what I'm really interested uh, uh, to do, what I really want to do in my postdoc is to discuss how is it possible to do philosophy interculturally, that, I that is by means of bringing different traditions together and uh, making them dialogue in order to be able to reflect on philosophical questions. Uh, but in order to answer that question of how to do philosophy interculturally, I, one must first ponder on the following question, how to think uh, the relationship between the self and the other. Eh, bueno, esto que voy a presentar podría tomarse como el borrador de mi trabajo postdoctoral. Mi pregunta o mi interés para esta investigación es eh, sobre la posibilidad de una filosofía intercultural. ¿Cómo es posible pensar, eh, traer a la discusión distintas eh, horizontes? Pero me parece que para enfrentar esa pregunta hay que preguntarnos eh, cómo pensar la relación entre el sí mismo y el otro. By the way, that's apparently one of the translations that was bad. Like, wherever it is mismo, it should be sí mismo, apparently. But either way, I think the two most basic ways one can conceive of the other in that case when we are questioning about what is the other is either has been essentially identical to oneself. So think, for instance, about what Paul Doyce says about Indian philosophy. And he claims that Indian philosophy and German idealism are fundamentally the same sort of philosophy, that is, idealism. And of course, he's not entirely wrong in seeing some sort of idealistic trend in Indian philosophies, but it's definitely not the sort of idealism we see in German idealism. So to claim that they are both the same is presupposing precisely that a philosophical trend present in your culture somehow is essential and is reflected also on the culture of the other. Eh, bueno, hay dos formas de concebir al otro, ¿no? Eh, o bien concebes al otro identificándolo con uno mismo de entrada, ¿no? 
eh, podemos ver esta noción, por ejemplo, en Paul Dessen cuando describe la filosofía de la India como una forma o análoga al idealismo alemán. ¿no? Claro, tiene un punto de reconocer que hay similitudes, que hay puntos eh, en común, pero eh, no puedo decir sin más que la filosofía de la India es idealismo alemán, no es lo mismo que la igualdad. On the other hand, you can also conceive of the other as utterly and absolutely different from oneself. And that seems to me something that Rorty, in a way, does when he talks about the different basic vocabularies of different cultures that somehow already frame our understanding so that it's not really possible to insert yourself into another's culture because you're always understanding it by means of your own vocabulary, your own references. Y la otra forma es tomar al otro como enteramente diferente. ¿no? En algún sentido pienso que esto es lo que Rorty sostiene eh, cuando habla de la diferencia de vocabularios básicos. ¿no? La idea de que eh, tenemos vocabularios que constituyen nuestro horizonte del mundo y que eso nos imposibilita entender a otra cultura sin adentrar a ella, hacerlo de entrada desde estos, este horizonte ya distinto. But... Uh, for me, both of these accounts uh, of the others seem to be entirely unsatisfying for several reasons. But I'm all, I think that one of the most interesting ones is what seems to, be to, be, to me to be a fundamental logical flaw in the way they conceive of identity and difference. Because if we think about it, uh, at least that's what I want to defend, both identity and difference only arise as products of comparison. Only by means of comparing something to something else can we determine then has it been either identical or different. Eh, bueno, yo lo, so, pienso que estas dos formas de tratar al otro eh, me parecen insatisfactorias. ¿no? Eh, en general, pero me parece que parten de un fallo lógico básico, que es que al hablar de identidad y de diferencia, estamos ya presuponiendo un plano de comparación. I think you actually said it better than I did in English. <laughs> uh, comparison, however, is only possible between things that are neither completely identical nor completely different. For if two things were completely identical, one would not even ask the question about whether they are identical or not. Even when we say A equal A, there's a minimal, in that case, numerical difference between the first and the second A. That's also a sort of point that Hegel stress when talking about identity. Even when we say E equal A, there's already a difference presupposed there. In fact, you are betraying the intention of this sort of equation because by saying A equal something else, you expect to have a further determination of that thing, but you're just given the same thing. Though. So that's the problem of abstract identity. But I, what I want to argue is that even in this abstract identity, there's already a sort of minimal difference. Mm. Well, uh y aquí, aquí está el problema, ¿no? O sea, la comparación, no puedo, no puedo comparar cosas enteramente idénticas ni, entera, ni completamente diferentes, ¿no? Eh, incluso cuando intentamos hablar de dos cosas completamente idénticas, ¿qué sentido tendría pregunta, comparar dos cosas completamente idénticas? La pregunta no, 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 no se haría. Incluso cuando planteamos eh, la identidad en términos de A igual A, suponemos una cierta diferencia, porque hay una A y luego una segunda A. ¿no? Este punto ya lo ilustró Hegel, ¿no? cuando decía que aun cuando hacemos un enunciado de identidad, este enunciado de identidad que pone A igual a, a supone que se gana alguna determinación con, con esta segunda A que se agrega, y bueno, ese es justo el problema de la identidad abstracta en Hegel. On the other hand, if two things were completely different, again, we could not even speak of their difference, say, since they could not possibly be simultaneously considered. Uh, for this implies that they have some common place. I'm already somehow intentionally drawing on, on Nishida here. But you know, I would just like to say that precisely in order to say that two things are different, they somehow have to be simultaneously considered, which means that somehow they have to have some common place uh, uh, where this comparison is made. Uh, y bueno, si fueran uh, completamente diferentes, algo parecido, ¿no? O sea, no podíamos siquiera concebirlas juntas o simultáneamente, ¿no? Eh, aquí apelando un poco a Nishida, para poder dar esta comparación tenemos que suponer un cierto campo común. So the only way that one, that will, the only way that one can actually speak of identity of, or difference, I want to argue for that reasons, is if there is a necessary relationship between the self and the other, by means of which self and other are both identical and different to each other. 
when we talk about uh, their, our self and the other, we already presuppose somehow a way of relating them, and, by, and because of that we have to somehow claim that they are both identical as well as different. In, in other words, and that's when, where dialectics comes in, one must think of the self and the other as being part of a, a dialectical relationship. Eh, a mi parecer, la única forma de hablar de identidad y diferencia es suponiendo una necesaria relación eh, a través, en términos de la cual las, las cosas comparadas son en cierto sentido idénticas y en cierto sentido diferentes una de otra. Eh, es, esto es finalmente lo que, lo, lo que significa la relación. ¿no? Eh, en otras palabras, debe haber una cierta eh, relación dialéctica entre ellos. So, but then w one could, could raise the question, which dialectics? Because, of course, so, uh, and that's also an issue I was talking ab about with Takeshi earlier on. Uh, there are many different sorts of dialectics, but, and there's raises, this raises the question of how to define it. But here, according to the, to the direction this presentation is going, I'd like to say that dialectics is this way of conceiving self and other as being in, in a necessary relationship by means of which they are both identical and different of each other. But the question then is, how to conceive of this relationship? How to explain its possibility and necessity? That is, how to explain that this relationship takes place in the, at all, and why is it a necessary relationship? Well, but the question is, what kind of dialectic? I had already mentioned before, the different types of dialectic. Para eh, hacia donde apunta esta presentación, eh, entiendo por dialéctica eh, la relación necesaria entre eh, el sí mismo y lo otro. Pero, ¿cómo entender esta relación? Eh, ¿Cómo entender su posibilidad y cómo entender su carácter de necesario? Uh, I think that the history of philosophy actually provides us with two basic models of dialectics that I have named here self-relation dialectics and other relation dialectics, and I'm going to explain soon what I mean by that. But basically, each model distinguishes itself from the other in how they explain why the relationship of the self to the other is a necessary one. That is, why this relationship must take place, why self and other are inseparable in some way. Well, I think the of philosophy has given two possibilities to understand this relationship. I would call it la que está basada en el, en, 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 en el sí mismo eh, y la que está basada en, lo, en el otro. ¿no? Eh, la distinción fundamental entre este tipo de, de dialéctica es eh, cómo van a entender el carácter necesario de la relación entre eh, el sí mismo y el otro. So, what I mean by self-relation dialectics in that case? For me, Self-relation dialectics explains the necessary relationship between self and other by deriving the other from the self. In other words, the other is a necessary product of the self by means of which it relates actually to itself. So a paradigmatic example of that would be, of, of course, I, I have in mind Hegel, the phenomenology of the spirit, the science of logic, and so on. Eh, bueno, la, la, la dialectica basada en el cinismo o en la relación con el sí mismo, eh, va a entender esta relación necesaria del sí mismo con lo otro, pensando lo otro como un producto del sí mismo. ¿no? Eh, el ejemplo de esto es, eh, lo que tengo en mente aquí, es la fotografía del espíritu de Hegel. So, for instance, I'm just going to, to leave the quote here and explain what I think, why the phenomenology of spirit uh, works in that way. Eh, bueno, eh, un ejemplo de esto, aquí dejo una cita de Hegel y voy a intentar explicar por qué creo que así funciona la, 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 la relación necesaria de Eléctrica en Hegel. So, in the phenomenology of the spirit, we are dealing precisely with how the conscience develops its own knowledge, uh, its vision, its knowledge, in such a way that it eventually overcomes the distinction between itself and uh, in between knowledge and the object of knowledge. So at first it seems that conscience and its knowledge is on the one side and its object on the other hand is on the other side has something separate and external to it, somehow independent of it. And throughout all figures of this imperfect conscience, of this phenomenic conscience so to speak, 
there remains some sort of external relationship between knowledge and that which of which it is, it is knowledge. Until eventually, however, conscience realizes that this object that she was always, uh, at, that it was always attempting to know was nothing but itself. Knowledge was no, knowing nothing else but knowledge. Knowledge itself posits its object and the way it is constituted. So this which first appeared as another that somehow came from the outside actually is only produced by means of the very process of knowledge. Eh, el proceso de la fenomenología del espíritu justamente sigue el desarrollo de la conciencia en su reconocimiento de que eh, ella misma era ese objeto que estaba buscando. ¿no? En las distintas figuras del de desarrollo de la conciencia, eh, la conciencia fenoménica en su estado imperfecto va siempre a ponerse algo frente, un objeto de su conocimiento. Eh, pero el desarrollo de la fenomenología justamente la va a llevar a percatarse que ese objeto de conocimiento es el conocimiento mismo y que entonces. And that, in fact, absolute, absolute knowledge is precisely this point uh, where the conscience reaches precisely the, uh, the recognition of this identity between knowledge and its object. That it's, that object of knowledge is knowledge itself. And that's why we reach the standpoint from which we can speak of logic, of the science of logic. Que eh, el conocimiento es el objeto del conocimiento. Y es desde este punto de partida desde donde se puede hablar de lógica. En la ciencia de la lógica, y de nuevo estoy dejando el cito aquí y estoy intentando explicar lo que quiero decir. En la ciencia de la lógica, y una vez más, aquí dejo la cita y voy a intentar explicar a qué, a qué, a qué me refiero. So there, Hegel is talking precisely of thinking, of thought, but already thought that has overcome the opposition between thought and being. So when we are talking about the determinations of thought here, we are actually talking also about the determinations of being. And moreover, this is interesting, uh, Hegel claims in the beginning of the science of logic that all further determinations of the beginning of philosophy, here the science of logic of course, are just further determinations of the same beginning of logic with, which is this beginning in being, in the indeterminate absolute which has, in fact, to negate itself and thus to further determine itself, but these determinations are not an authentic other, as, as the quote says. It's not something that is really external to, to, to philosophy, but rather can only be produced as a product of its self-determination. Eh, bueno, eh, la ciencia y la lógica, veremos a, a Hegel pensando las tendencias del pensar, pero es una cuestión en que la decisión entre pensar y ser ha sido ya superada. Entonces las determinaciones del pensar que se explican ahí son la, las mismas que las determinaciones del ser. Eh, más aún, eh, pensará eh, Hegel que las determinaciones alcanzadas por el pensar están ya de algún modo en el punto de partida indeterminado del que se empezó. No, no hay una diferencia aquí, sino, simple, sino que ya están de hecho eh, en ese punto de partida eh, implícito. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, just to give some ideas of uh, how to put this self-relation dialectics in images, and those are images that are in the Stanford Encyclopedia. So you have different levels of this relationship in which uh, somehow you have a self that encompasses everything. I'm not going to go into detail here, but I think the, the, the most important point is that Hegel defines his system as a circle of circles, as is per uh, mostly il illustrated by the last image. And so you have somehow Different determinations, but they are all encompassed by a larger, a larger system from which all those determinations are only self-determinations of this very system. Eh, bueno, y aquí están algunas situaciones de la enciclopedia de Stanford de este modelo de Hegel. Eh, no entraré en detalle en ellas, pero solamente quiero subrayar cómo Hegel describía su sistema como un círculo de círculos. ¿no? Eh, tal vez el que mejor lo ilustra es el último, la última imagen en que vemos cómo eh, todos estos momentos, estos círculos, eh, están contenidos por un círculo, un sistema más grande, y en el fondo no son más que autodeterminaciones de este, eh, de, de este círculo, este sistema más grande. So, now moving on to other relation dialectics. Uh, eh, bueno, y ahora entrando a la, a la dialéctica centrada en, en, en el otro o de la relación de este otro. 
So on the other hand, I want to argue that other relation dialectics explains the necessary relationship between self and other, but by claiming that neither self nor the other could exist outside of their relationship. Thus, the self can only exist because it relates to something other to itself, to something that is external to itself, that isn't a product of its self-determination. And for me, a par uh, paradigmatic example of this other relation dialectics would be Nagarjuna, particularly in his most well-known book, the Mulavadya Makakarika, the fundamental wisdom of the middle way. Eh, bueno, y ahora es, esta, esta otra forma de dialéctica se caracterizaría porque pensará que la relación entre el sí mismo y el otro es necesaria porque ni el sí mismo ni el otro existen externos a esta relación, que requieren esta relación para ser lo que son. Eh, el ejemplo más claro de esto, a mi parecer, es justamente Nagarjuna en su obra más conocida, Fundamento de la Vía, de la vía Media. Also a better translation of the title than the one here. <laughs> so, uh, here is also a quote from the book, and I'm going to try to explain the idea shortly. So, precisely the, the argument that uh, Nagarjuna wants to establish in this book is the negation of the very idea of swabhava, of intrinsic nature, that something somehow has an intrinsic nature that subsists independently of, re of its relationship to other things, to other phenomena. And then we have the beginning of the, we have this quote from the, uh, chapter 15 of the book, which is precisely about swabhava, about essence, as it's translated in this translation, in which he says, essence arising from causes and conditions makes no sense. If essence came from causes and conditions, then it would be fabricated. How could it be appropriate for fabricated essence to come to be? Essence itself is not artificial and does not depend on another. Uh, those who see essence and essential difference and entities and non-entities, they do not see the truth taught by the Buddha. Eh, bueno, eh, en, este, en, en este pasaje se pone en esto la idea de su abata, ¿no? que es la idea de la eh, naturaleza intrínseca de las cosas. Que alguna cosa tendría una naturaleza intrínseca independientemente de sus relaciones. ¿no? Aquí esta es una cita del apartado 15, justo sobre el concepto de su abata, que se traduce como esencia, eh, la, la ley eh, la esencia surge, que la esencia surja de las causas y las condiciones no tiene sentido. Si la esencia viniera de las causas y las condiciones, entonces sería fabricada y cómo podría ser eh, adecuado eh, fabricarles, fa, donde la esencia fabrica, fabricada llegara a ser el caso. Es, la esencia misma no es artificial, no depende de otro. Aquellos que creen que la esencia y la diferencia esencial y, 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 y las entidades eh, y las no entidades no ven la verdad enseñada por el Buda. So, uh, basically, here is very clear this denial of the existence of intrinsic nature. Uh, which amounts to emptiness, to shunyata, to this, the concept precisely of emptiness, which always is emptiness of swabhava. Emptiness is emptiness of something, emptiness of, and some, in this something is essence. But one could ask, one could then ask, well, but then in that case, is emptiness itself the ground of everything that is? Could one say that emptiness has, is the intrinsic nature of all things because all things are empty? To which the reply would be, of course, in the case of Nagarjuna, no. And that, that is what's commonly known as the idea of the emptiness of emptiness. Emptiness itself is not substantial. It is, it, it is not something that has intrinsic nature, but it itself is codependent of the phenomena it's emptiness of. And this, of course, this is a, there are many controversial inter interpretations of what this means. And uh, I also have a particular one that I can't really f explore very deeply here, but that's how I would mostly read this very well-known passage of the Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, where he says, whatever is dependently co-arisen, that, that is explained to be emptiness. That, being a dependent designation, is itself the Middle Way. Meaning precisely that uh, ultimate truth uh, and conventional truth, the two different levels of truth in Buddhism, ultimately coincide because to be empty means precisely to be conventional, to only exist in a net of relationship to other phenomena.
Eh, ok, bueno, justamente el concepto de shunyata o de vacuidad eh, en Nagarjuna es una vacuidad de este suabá, de esta esencia o naturaleza intrínseca. Pero eh, pronto se puede hacer la crítica de que si la vacuidad o el shunyata es la naturaleza de todo lo ente, no es justamente eso, es una naturaleza intrínseca. Eh, a lo que Nagarjuna evidentemente respondería que no. Eh, justamente la vacuidad, eh, que eso, es, eso es lo que se, se intenta expresar cuando se habla de la vacuidad de la vacuidad. Eh, eh, la vacuidad es este, codependiente de aquello de lo, que, de, de, de lo que sería o podría entenderse como fundamento. Eh, eso lo podemos ver en la siguiente cita. Lo que sea que surge, que, que co-surge dependientemente, eso es, eh, es lo que se explica que es la vacuidad. Eh, eh, eso, eso justamente ser designado dependiente o ser una, una designación dependiente es ello mismo la vía media. Eh, la realidad última y la realidad entonces para, para la Gargina, la realidad última y la realidad convencional coexistirían porque aquello que es en última instancia la realidad última no sería es exactamente lo mismo que lo que se presenta como el sistema de relaciones de la realidad convencional. And again, to put that somehow in images, I really, really like this image, uh, the symbol which I first found in Tibetan Buddhism, but Takeshi has also told me that there is also the symbol in Chinese Buddhism. But this is supposed to be precisely the symbol for codependent origination. And I think it's very interesting because if you think of the circles as individuals, and if you pay attention to the image, you realize that none of them is traced with an independent line from the others. All are traced by one line that connects all of them. And so if you were to undo the line that creates one of the individuals, you would undo all individuals altogether. And a very interesting uh, aspect of this image as well is that you don't have any single circle has the center of the image. You don't have some sort of individual that lies at the center of this connection. Rather, what you have at the center, and this is also very interesting, is the very crossing of the lines that constitute the individuals. Eh, bueno, a mí me parece que se ilustra bastante bien con esta imagen que yo había encontrado de entrada en el budismo tibetano, aunque el profesor Morisato me ha, me ha comentado que también puede rastrearse en el budismo chino. Esta imagen se utiliza para ilustrar el sufrimiento condicionado y justamente podemos notar que eh, todos los círculos que constituyen esta figura están todos, ninguno está formado por una línea cerrada, sino todo está formado por la misma línea. Eh, tal que si se rompiera una de las líneas, se desharía todo en eh, es, es la relación. Eh, además, vale subrayar que en esta figura ninguno de los, de los círculos que puedo entender como sí mismos eh, se encuentran en el centro, sino que de hecho lo que está en el centro es el entrecruzamiento de ellos. However, There seems to be a curious paradox concerning those two models. That is, that each conceives the other as fundamentally undialectical. What do I mean for that? I mean that for self-relation dialectics, no relationship to the other that isn't ultimately a relationship to the self can be dialectical, in the sense that it can't explain the necessary relationship between self and the other. So think about all the critiques that Hegel makes of understanding as opposed to reason, because understanding op op uh, operates with external oppositions and so there's always something that it is external to oneself and thus you don't really get a dialectical uh, relationship because you have fixed, fixed oppositions. And on the other hand with Nagarjuna of course by, uh, uh, the very book of the fundamental wisdom of the middle way, he, the way he argues is always in the sense that well if we take seriously the idea that something has an intrinsic nature and thus uh, somehow uh, subsists on its own, then it's simply not tenable how could it be possible for it to relate to something else because if we take this idea seriously, this relationship couldn't, couldn't be possible at all. So both models take the other model to be fundamentally undialectical, to be fundamentally incapable of accounting for this necessary relationship between self and other. Eh, bueno, pero aquí surge una cuestión, ¿no? A, a, ambas interpretaciones de la dialéctica pueden acusar a la otra de ser no dialéctica, ¿no? Por un lado, eh, esta, la, la, la dialéctica basada en el otro eh, podrá ser criticada 
bajo la idea de que donde hay una relación dialéctica, si sí, la relación entre el sí mismo y el otro se mantiene fija. Esto es, eh, nunca hay un regreso en que se descubre al otro como parte del sí mismo. Eh, esto lo podemos pensar eh, a través de la eh, crítica al entendimiento, la, la relación entre entendimiento y razón. ¿no? La, el entendimiento no sería eh, una relación dialéctica porque los extremos de esa relación se mantendrían siempre fijos. Eh, en cambio, eh, en el libro de Nagar y vamos a encontrar también una posible crítica a eh, la dialéctica central del cinismo, porque eh, dice Nagarina, algo que está centrado en sí mismo, ¿cómo sería posible que se relacionara con otro? Entonces, de ahí, algo que esté por sí mismo puede relacionarse con otro, eh, y de ahí se presenta como no podría haber ningún lugar para una dialéctica, para una relación, en, eh, tampoco centrada en sí mismo. Entonces, ambas lesiones pueden explicarse en los dialéctico. But then the question is, why not both? Because it seems this way of, uh, of each model criticizing the other seems fundamentally unsatisfying. I mean, why should we assume that we should search either only in the self or in the other the explanation for this ne necessary relationship between self and other? And it seems that for me, to me that this happens because somehow we are searching for a principle by means of which we are able to determine this relationship between self and other. There must be a principle that accounts for this relationship. But what if we don't need one single principle to explain that relation? Why not both self and other dialectics? But well, now the question is, and why not the two? It seems that if one is satisfactory to explain the question, why not take both? Why not start from the self and from the other? Now it seems that what is motivated to choose entre una dialéctica central en sí mismo o una dialéctica central en el otro es justamente el deseo de encontrar un principio que explique la relación sea en sí mismo o sea el otro eh, pero ahora, ¿por qué no explicar la relación desde sí mismo y desde el otro? desde los dos eh, la... That's where, after 30 minutes of talk, I finally come to Nishida I'm uh, sorry about that, uh, but I think in a way that what, what Nishida is trying to do is precisely to unite both these models of dialectics or in Nishida's terms, particularly in this uh, work of his, uh, of, of his which I'm, in which I'm mostly basing myself here now, the self-identity and continuity of, of the world, but in his terms, the determination of the individual by itself or its self-determination and the determination of the individual by the universal. And I think that's why Nishida conceives of the place of, of Soku, of absolute nothingness, as the principle of his absolute dialectics. Eh, y bueno, justamente después de media hora de charla, eh, por fin llegó a Nishida, eh, que creo que justamente lo que Nishida intenta es esto, ¿no? Eh, una dialéctica que no esté eh, central en los extremos. Eh, yo me baso en el libro de la autoidentidad eh, y, la, y, y, y la continuidad del mundo. Eh, donde justamente eh, me parece que Nishida eh, pondrá el énfasis en el concepto de, de Soku, de lugar, como el campo para que se despliegue esta relación. And, well, as, as we know, Nishida uses many different concepts in order to try to find a better way to describe and express this, his, his concept of absolute nothingness. Beginning with pure experience, basho, so cool, world, the historical world, and speaking of also in terms of self-determination of the world, contradictory self-identity. But however, for me, the most promising of these expressions seems to be, alongside with Soku, an expression that he uses in this work, the self-identity and continuity of the world, the determination without determinant. Uh, well, uh Nishida busca muchos conceptos para intentar eh, ilustrar su, su, su nada absoluta, eh, como esa experiencia pura, bajo, soku, mundo histórico, autodeterminación del mundo, contra, identidad autocontradictoria, pero yo pienso que eh, junto con Soku, eh, la, la más prometedora descripción la emplea en el trabajo eh, mencionado, y es la determinación sin algo que determina. Uh, and here's one particular quote where he talks about that and he says, what does contradictory self-identity mean? 
contradictory self-identity identity can neither be a single individual that unifies everything in the direction of the individual the determination, we could say here of the self-relation in dialectics, nor the universal that encloses everything in the direction of universal determination of other relation dialectics, we could say. If someone represents to himself something in one of both these directions, then one is not dealing with a contradictory unity. This is why I speak from a determination without determinant, and I'm quoting the German translation because I still can't speak in Japanese, but uh, this is the original German translation, uh, translation the Bestimmung ohne Bestimmendes, or a determination from nothing, Bestimmung des Nichts, that could also be a determination of nothing, depending on how you translate. Eh, bueno, y aquí hay una cita de, de Ishida que ilustra la cuestión. Eh, ¿qué, da, ¿Qué significa identidad autocontradictoria? La identidad autocontradictoria no significa ser un individuo singular que unifica todo en la dirección del individuo, de, la, de la interacción individual, no eh, ser el universal que encierra todo en la dirección de, de la televisión universal. Si alguien representa, se representa a sí mismo, eh, algo en alguna de estas dos direcciones, entonces no está tratando con una eh, unidad contradictoria. Por eso yo hablo de una determinación sin determinantes, sin algo que determinar. Eh, vecino, eh, one, destinendes. O una determinación desde la nada. Vecino, destin, que también puede ser una determinación de la nada según cómo se interpreta. So, why do I think that this expression uh, of determination without a determinant uh, seems, to be, uh, it seems to be one of the most promising? Because it seems for me that it's the one that better captures the result of conceiving the relationship of self and other in terms of self so other there is the simultaneity from self and other. Uh, because when self and other are simultaneous, none of them is the one determinant that explains the fact that they are related to one another. The relationship between them both is thus a determination that is neither, neither entirely grounded on the self nor entirely grounded on the other. Ahora, ¿por qué pienso que esta eh, interpretación de el, la determinación sin determinante es la más prometedora? Porque creo que, este, que esta forma de ponerlo ilustra la idea de que, de que este soku es un soku en que ni lo determinante es el sí mismo ni lo determinante es el otro. Uh, and we also think that those are con the concepts which point to the most promising directions by means of which we could think about this uh, putting together of self and other relation dialectics because other Nishida's expressions, Basho, historic world and the idea that comes uh, coupled with those expressions such as the self-determination of the historical world, the self-determination of the place, and so on, uh, they seem to me to run the risk of falling back to a Hegelian mode of self-determination. I mean, even in this case, of course, there would be several differences between Hegel and Nishida. I, I, uh, I also discussed that uh, on another occasion, how we, one could say that both Hegel and Nishida have a sort of non-predicative logic, but the way, the direction in which this logic goes is very different but you still would have a model of self-determination in which the other is only the product, is only a product of the self by means of which it relates to itself and it furthers its own determination. I think this is also connected to something that Heisig said in the, in the in OGP that took place in Brussels where he criticized the, the fact that, we, that in, in, in Kyoto school philosophy one talks about absolute nothingness and this absolute would be sort of an intrusion here of uh, ideas that don't really uh, adapt very well to the concept of nothingness. Eh, bueno, ahora, ¿por qué pienso que esta, esta lectura de determinante si, si la determinación determinante es la más prometedora? Porque las otras lecturas o las otras interpretaciones o modos de poner la cuestión que intenta Nishida eh, está siempre jugando un rol en sí mismo. Eh, y esto pareciera hacer un guiño a una posible lectura al estilo de Hegel, ¿no? en que finalmente lo otro se, se entiende siempre a la luz de sí mismo. Eh, aunque claro, yo tengo la posición de que tanto en Nishida como en Hegel hay una cierta lógica no predicativa, aunque la llevan en direcciones distintas, eh, 
pero bueno, esa no es, seguiría habiendo la posibilidad de, de hacer esta lectura en que el, 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 el otro está siempre en función de sí mismo. Eh, creo que esto va en consonancia con lo que dijo Hayek en, en Bruselas, eh, que eh, justamente critica que en la escuela de Kioto eh, se utilice el concepto de nada absoluta, y que tanto no el concepto de absoluto es una categoría que no debe emplearse o que no hace mucho sentido para abordar el tema de la nada. And, well, now to try to think of different images of Soku the way I'm, I'm intending here. Uh, well, and now I, I really go back to ha Hakel's presentation because that's what really put me a co in a corner in the way that I was thinking about this. Because for me, the fundamental question with this image that ha Hakel used as well is, well, you can have the self and the other and you have the point of intersection. And for me, the question was where to locate Basho in that sense. Should we locate it in the middle or should we locate it precisely in, the, in this uh, fundo sem fundo, in this background with no background? And of course, I'm, I'm more than convinced that Nishida would think that the latter is the case. That is, that you have this uh, fundo sem fundo, which is actually the absolute nothingness. Oh, yeah. Bueno, intenté ilustrar ahora esta cuestión con, con, con una imagen. Eh, pero bueno, debo aceptar que la conferencia de Raquel justamente puso contra las cuerdas, ya que ella empleó también una imagen eh, parecida y me, me, me levanta esta cuestión. ¿no? Este, vemos al sí mismo y al otro y a un, a un, a un plano en que se entrecruzan. ¿no? Pero es este plano en que se entrecruzan lo que vamos a entender como barrio. O más bien sería el fondo sin fondo que está a la base de esta relación. ¿no? Yo pienso que Nishida más bien pensaría que esto seguro. But then, that's why I think, I think at the same time that this is precisely what brings the risk of falling back into a Hegelian model of self-determination. Because uh, what, I, what I mean to say by that is, I think the, the place, so to speak, where you really have self so other is precisely the, this, the point of intersection. Where you have the, the, the background, this seems to me that would ultimately fall back to a sort of higher order self which has a self, has this higher plane, is not really related to something other, and thus is not really so-called self-other. And this seems to me to be connected with the Nabi's critique, the critique that Nishida would fall back into being because of how he conceives of absolute nothing as pure immediacy, and immediacy is being. So this raises this concern. Eh, bueno, no. eh, aunque debo aceptar que considero ¿no? que también esa interpretación que toma al Basho o al Soku como este fondo sin fondo desde donde parte la relación, eh, abre la puerta a volver a la lectura hegeliana en que finalmente la relación o la diferencia estaría reducida en última instancia a un cinismo más fundamental. Eh, entonces yo pienso que realmente donde el Soku se hace manifiesto es el punto de cruz eh, y que tanto no tiene esto que ver con la crítica que hace Tanabe a Nishida, en que piensa que en virtud de que Nishida o que tanto Nishida piensa eh, la nididad, la vacuidad, desde la plana absoluta, desde la, la, como algo inmediato, y si lo inmediato es el ser, o lo, lo que se inmediato es el ser, pues que tanto no está recayendo en una eh, lógica del ser. Uh, so, to, to try to illustrate this more clearly, let's think in more abstract terms. If you have on the one side A and one on the other side B, and you have the intersection of A and B, and you have the background, which is C. What is the issue there? Precisely because A and A intersection B and B are in the same background as C, they're ultimately identical to C. So we have A equals C, B equals C, but also A intersection B equals C. So ultimately, you could say that you have C's everywhere. Y justamente en virtud de que todo todo parte desde el trasfondo de C, pues va en cierto sentido en C, B en cierto sentido en C, la intersección de A y B es en cierto sentido C, y al final lo que tienes es C. Of course, I, I don't mean this as an abstract identity in the sense that there would, wouldn't be f uh, individuals or further determinations that would be denying precisely the Shida's point. But either way, those would still be determinations of C, so we could say it's 
C A, C B, C intersection A and B, but still it's C. It's a further determination of C. Eh, y bueno, por eso no quiero plantear una idea abstracta en la que lleguen las determinaciones de los individuos, pero al final de cuentas, la determinación A, la determinación B, la determinación A y la decisión de B, eh, serían todas determinaciones de C. And that's why I actually want to bring uh, into discussion another concept, which is a concept from uh, Professor Hamadar Mao. He, he's a, an Indian professor that teaches in the University of Vienna, has been teaching there for 40 years. That, that is why the concept he uses is, a, is in German. Uh, this concept of Otthafte Otlösigkeit, or situated unsituatedness, that I'm very sorry to make you translate. <laughs> <laughs> Bueno, eh, y ahora quiero traer a, a relucir a Ram Adhar Mal, que es un profesor de la Universidad de Bruselas, tiene dando clases ahí y ya 40 años. Y Viena. ¿Hm? No, pro, it's not Brussels, dude. Viena. Ah, <laughs> Viena, disculpe. Eh, y eh, eh, por eso su concepto está en alemán. Eh, una disculpa por eh, que tengas que traducirlo. Sería algo así como la situación situada. Eh... And I think this idea of what have to what lose is kind of situated unsituatedness is very close to the way I would read this idea of determination without determinant. Because, uh, and as Mao says, and this is actually a conference he gave in Brazil where he says, as a consequence, intercultural philosophy entails the idea of developing a new type of historiography of philosophy. The universal idea of rationality, for example, is no doubt culture bound, bound but it also transcends cultural limitations. It possesses some sort of a situated, unsituatedness, or unsituated, situatedness. Well, this is a conference that he gave in Brazil. As a consequence, the philosophy of intercultural implicates the idea of generating a new history of historiography. The idea of the universal reason, for example, is indeed a limit of cultural or is in limits of cultural, but also transcends these limitations. Posee una cierta localización sin localización o una no localización localizada. Yeah, that, that was good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so what, what, what is interesting about that way? Because I think it precisely expresses bad, uh, the, uh, in a very nice way what is this, this aspect of being in the intersection. Because in, in a way it's odd half, it's located, it, it, it is within a place. But at the, same t at the same time, it's something that is not reducible to either of the places, so to speak, that somehow constitute it. It somehow also transcends them. It somehow, and moreover, that is the most interesting part I want to emphasize. It's what enables transitioning between them. Eh, y bueno, eso justamente nos lleva al punto de la cuestión, ¿no? Eh, en virtud de que la, de, la determinación es determinante o esta localidad no localizada eh, es, no solamente está en la relación, sino que la trasciende, ¿no? Y, no, y, más, y más aún, es la posibilidad misma de relación. So, just to try to use some examples, because I'm talking about uh, the idea of making intercultural philosophy, so I wanted to bring some examples of how, how one could possibly apply that. Eh, bueno, y para poner unos ejemplos, ya que justo el tema era pensar la posibilidad de la filosofía intercultural y la demostrar cómo podría aplicarse eso. So, one example I thought of is precisely if, if we think on, on the one hand about Hellenistic philosophy uh, and on the other hand of Indian philosophy. For example, if we wanted to compare the philosophy of the Hellenic on one hand and the philosophy of the India, it may seem at first that they are different in many aspects, and, and of course that is correct. But if we take into consideration, for instance, books like from Pierre Hadot of uh, philosophy about ancient philosophy, where he argues for the point that ancient philosophy was to be seen as a, some sort of spiritual exercise by means of which the individual must transform itself and change his comprehension of how he is inserted in the world, then in that case we have a point in common, a sort of intersection between Hellenistic philosophy and Indian philosophy. Eh, bueno, de entrada, eh, reconoceríamos que tienen inmensas diferencias, cosa que es cierta. Pero, por ejemplo, tomamos la posición de Fiora Mott y reconocemos que eh, la filosofía de la India, de la filosofía helénica, algunos pueden entenderse como una eh, práctica espiritual, pues encontramos ahí una conexión con la filosofía de la India. 
This is not to mean, of course, that they will be the exact same practices or they, that they will have exactly the same presuppositions, but on the contrary, what is interesting is precisely how this enables us to see in what way though this philosophy has a way of life it pr is practiced differently and with different presuppositions. And in what way, by recognizing this common point, we, we can transition from a way of, from a, an Hellenistic way of understanding that to an Indian way of understanding that and vice versa. Eh, y bueno, para eso no quiere decir que la filosofía helénica va a hacerse lo mismo que la filosofía de la India, sino justamente va a hacer lo que permita enfatizar y reconocer sus diferencias y lo que permita eh, ese diálogo. And only, only to conclude, uh, but I think that the, really, the, the best example that was given wasn't the example I, I was going to give, but was actually the example gave, given by Maraldo today, when he was talking about intelligence and intelligence in human beings and in nature. Eh, y bueno, el mejor, el mejor ejemplo que usaron esto no es mío, sino justamente fue el que dio hace un momento Maraldo sobre la inteligencia, la naturaleza y la inteligencia de los seres humanos. Because, of course, we can think at first that uh, human beings and nature are very different, but assuming that there's this very general point of intersection, which is intelligence, as long as this doesn't imply that we are going to think of this intelligence as exactly the same as human intelligence, this allows us to understand in what way not only uh, nature intelligence is different from human intelligence, but at the same time to recognize things about our own intelligence we couldn't recognize before. Eh, y bueno, justamente en este punto eh, partimos ¿no? de que la naturaleza y, y, y la inteligencia humana son diferentes, pero desde la inteligencia podemos reconocer en un plano común y a la vez un plano de diferencia, de que la inteligencia natural sería marcadamente distinta a la humana y a la vez habría la posibilidad de reconocer cuestiones de la inteligencia humana que por sí sola no podríamos reconocer. And well, I, I, I'm already going to finish here because I'm way over time. Sorry for that, but thank you very much for listening. Eh, hasta aquí dejo la, la conferencia porque ya estoy eh, bastante sobre tiempo. Eh, muchas gracias por todo. So, since I have, uh, well, we have a little time, although I have many questions for you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, th thank you very much. I, I think the, the best way to understand that is coming back to the discussion I made at, at, at the beginning. Uh, in a way, I want to argue that this very idea of an intersection is not only that we should uh, uh, prior prioritize it over identity and difference, it's that we, one can't even speak of identity or difference without presupposing some point of intersection. Because without this intersection, there is no possible comparison. There must be some common point by means of which you can say what is identical and what is different. So, and, and that I want to argue from a very logical point of view, meaning whenever you are talking about identity, you are already talking also about minimal difference, infinitesimal difference if you want, and on the other hand, if you're talking about difference, you're also talking about infinitesimal identity or minimal identity. So what you really have ultimately are always intersections. Uh, and so, but what, what's, what is really interesting to me about that and, uh, and, and, and the way that is not only a ground for, for uh, thinking about the relationship, but also for the transitioning and also of changing is precisely because by this, by this common point, one can actually transi transit from one side to another. One can actually change, for instance, their own views on, on philosophy. One can change their own views on human intelligence. Because by seeing that this common point allows you a connection to another determination, another, another perspective that you couldn't see before. So, 
This is why it's, it's situated unsitua in unsituatedness, I think, because at the same time that it's always local, it always has a connection to a uh, determinate context, it's also what allows you to, in a way, transcend or to go beyond that context. So what, that's what's really interesting of it. Me parece que es el caso porque solo hay posibilidad de comparación donde hay algún tipo de terreno común. ¿no? Eh, incluso cuando hablamos de diferenciar dos cosas, algo tiene que tener común para que podamos diferenciarlo. Y eh, más aún, ¿no? cuando hablamos de identidad, incluso en un sentido lógico, eh, suponemos algún tipo de diferencia, aunque sea infinitesimal, pero si no, 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 no tiene sentido. Entonces, debe haber siempre este plano de, de relación común como condición de posibilidad. Eh, y es muy interesante, pero justamente al pensar cosas de filosofía sobre el sucedimiento del de pensamiento y demás, eh, nos abre la puerta para ir más allá, para trascender el tema. Por eso es una localización no localizada, porque es una localización que nos permite, está, está, sobre, está en un punto que nos permite eh, trascender. Eh, bueno, creo que ya más bien tenemos que cerrar. Eh, les agradecemos mucho una vez más. Eh, otro aplauso para nuestros colegas. Gracias. Gracias.